thank God. Check. There we go. Microphones work better when they're on. I like them much better. The tone was good before, just not much volume. Amen. Thank God. What a wonderful building this is. I love this building. I love how bright it is. And imagine when Pastor Ruby was first telling me about uh, the vision of the building and now to see here is what it's for, is conference. And uh, I am so excited to be here. What a great time we had today. I cannot believe that I get to do this as a job. I, I have a lot of fun. I'm going to tell you that I had fun this morning and uh, being able to challenge people. So I'm going to challenge you on something else that I believe God's going to help you from 1 Kings chapter 17. Thank you, Pastor Ruby, for the invitation. And uh, the Rubies are such a great blessing to my wife and I and our fellowship. 1 Kings 17. The Prescott Church experienced a miracle revival, conversions, disciples, direction, and outreach. My father connects the breakthrough of revival in uh, the work of God to a revival meeting that he had in the early days with John Metzler. You have to understand the Prescott Church <clears throat> had always struggled financially it was in debt. It had, had never supported a pastor. Here's a fun fact some of you didn't know. Chuck Smith, the founder, founder of Calvary Chapel, he used to be the pastor of the Prescott Church in the 1950s. But he was there, and he left in under a year because he said there was no money there. And he got an offer in Tucson that was going to pay him a little bit better. So that gives you a background. My, uh, uh, my father took over the church in 1970, a church struggling financially. He had a meeting shortly after getting there with a man named John Metzler. The revival went for two weeks. John Metzler, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Every night, there was a regular offering taken by my father. But John Metzler, every single night of the revival, he took a second offering. And my father said something shifted, not only financially, but something broke through in the congregation that lasts to this day of finances and a supernatural Dimension. In other words, what was established was money dominion. The text that we're going to read, Elijah had a supernatural dimension of, of God at work in his life for miracle provision. Elijah had money dominion. If you want God to help you in life, you need money dominion. I'm going to preach about money dominion. 1 Kings 17, 2 through 9. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward. Hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. It will be that you shall drink from the brook. I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows to the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, bread and meat in the evening. He drank from the brook. And it happened after a while the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Money dominion. Let's begin. I want to talk about the need for money. We can make mistakes about money in life. Some people believe that money is not spiritual. They believe what we did in the offering, and Pastor Warner, that's just you have to pay the bills, so we take offerings. I have heard pastors stand behind the pulpit taking offering and say to the audience, I don't want you to think we're after your money. What a dumb statement. If you're a preacher, of course we're after people's money. How else will we pay for the bills, right? That's foolishness. There are others who say money isn't, isn't important. 
You want to make disciples. I've heard guys say, yeah, he's a great guy. He's just not very good with money. Money is intended to reveal the heart. I lived in Australia. I had a man on a uh, 60 Minutes or one of those news shows that they interviewed him. He was blind. The problem was when the show aired, people called in. His name was Ernie Hopkins. They said, we know Ernie. He's not blind. So how do you tell if someone's, if you ask Ernie, you're blind, he had the glasses, had a cane, so they knew which way Ernie would be walking, and they planted a $20 bill on the sidewalk. Ernie is tap, tap, tapping his way until he got to the 20, reached down and picked it up. Money revealed, that is the power, you better understand that. Jesus watched the treasury because money reveals. In our text, it tells us something. The will of God requires resources. God's will requires finances. Elijah has a calling from God. He has an eternal purpose, but he still needs a place to stay and food to eat. Every person here, you have personal needs. You need money and resources, Housing, food, utilities, vehicle, clothing, schooling, bills, medical, on and on. And inflation is driving up the price of everything. You personally have financial needs. There are ministry needs. The ministry, the work of God needs money and resources. Accomplishing God's will requires money, equipment, vehicles, buildings, You want to minister, you want to have effective ministry in the church, revivals, concert uh, uh, ministry, special events, children ministry. All of those require finances. And then planting churches is expensive. I trust if you plant churches, you understand you have an obligation for a financial commitment, not just be blessed, warmed, and filled, and tell us how it goes. Ministry needs. People we minister to, if you're a pastor, they need money and resources. My wife and I went to Johannesburg, South Africa, 1997, the area where we pastored El Dorado Park. The official unemployment rate at that time was 37%. That was for all ages, certain age groups, the unemployment rate was 60 to 70%. They needed money. We all pastor, we minister to people. They're bound by debt, struggling with housing and vehicles, and there are people that can never get ahead. Notice in our text, God calls us beyond our resources. God doesn't simply call us to do things that we can pay for with what's already in our pocket. He called Elijah during difficult circumstances. It was a time of famine. That's a bad time to start a new ministry. He called Elijah to difficult places, the wilderness and a foreign country. How do you get resources in the middle of nowhere? And if you're in a foreign country, the people are less likely to want to help you, but God called him Beyond his resources. Listen, the will of God in the Great Commission is beyond our resources. I remember years ago we planted the church, first church in Cuenca, Ecuador. The reason why someone gave me an article at that time, they said Cuenca, Ecuador had one of the lowest cost of living. It was one of the cheapest places to live in the world. And I said, yes, please. Planted a church there. That, that was great. I, I read of people, you know, in the Midwest. I went there and I rented a house for $600. Like, that's great. But the problem is not everywhere is cheap. You want to, the great cities of the world are expensive. Some nations are expensive. You want to plant churches on islands. They are expensive. We planted a church in Juba, South Sudan, the first church, and God is going to do wonderful things there. And then it came time for Wes and Denise Neary. They need a vehicle, and and, uh, I don't want to buy something that has a jillion miles, and it's a rough 
road and it's going to get beat up. We're going to have to fix it every week. And so I said, find something low uh, mileage. And he began to send me prices. Yeah, I found one for $56,000, $52,000. I was overjoyed when he told me I found one for $38,000. That's the highest we've ever paid for a vehicle. But I was like, yes. Thank God it wasn't 56. Expensive to do the will of God. Listen, we can't write off the bulk of the world's population because it's expensive. God's calling involves money. It's no accident the story of Elijah's calling involves a miracle supply of resources. Your future is going to be determined by money. Those who are in debt and not get the victory, they hinder and stop their future. Those who have money dominion, God is able to bless and use them. Your impact will be determined by money. Your ability to give personally, your ability to send will be determined by money. And your legacy will be determined by money. The scripture our brother just read, uh, Matthew 26, 13, in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told as a memorial to her. My father took the Prescott Church that had never had money, had always struggled. They tried to finance this church by selling tacos on the 4th of July. White people selling tacos is not a good plan. Can you say amen? Amen. It wasn't working. But my father broke through financially and entered into money dominion. And out of that had the resources to be able to plant churches. The second of which was Tucson, Arizona. Many of you, you are saved today because my father had money dominion. That is a legacy that pays on and on and on in life. My father was famous for investing not only in the nations personally, but giving to churches that had no personal connection uh, uh, to him. The building that we have in Prescott, incredibly expensive, but thousands of people are blessed. That's part of my father's legacy of money. Dominion. Let's talk secondly about the spiritual dimension of money. Money is more than a necessity or a resource. Money is supernatural. Please listen to me here. What happens in money will affect every single area of your life. It affects your heart. That's a whole sermon in itself. It affects your prayers. Cornelius, the angel appeared your prayers and your giving. God has heard that. It's a memorial. Your giving affects what you pray and whether that is answered. It affects your fruitfulness. The woman at Shunem, her and her husband, invested in Elisha's ministry, and it triggered a miracle of fruitfulness, and they had a son. So it is supernatural. It affects your life. In our text, there is a principle of money, and I want you to note this. That principle is money first. Money first. Notice that Elijah saw money miracles before he saw ministry impact. Before the showdown with the prophets of Baal and impacting the nation, he saw personal financial miracles and miracle supply. In Hebrews 11, the roll call of faith, the very first example of faith given is an offering. Hebrews 11.4, by faith, Abel offered to God. That is the starting point of faith according to Hebrews 11. Very interesting. Unless you can believe and obey God in the area of money, it's money first, you are going to struggle to believe and obey God in other areas 
of life as well. I have never seen someone be greatly fruitful over time who was not a liberal giver. I never see people who have great miracles over time who they're not a liberal giver. It's money first because money is a visible, it is a tangible way to believe and obey God. The problem with some people, they want to have the power to raise the dead and have cripples come out of wheelchairs, but they don't even tithe. That's not going to work. Money first. There are people that can't believe God. There, there are some, while Pastor Warner was speaking by the Spirit of God, God was telling you what he wanted to do, but you can't believe it. You're saying, get behind me, Satan. That's from hell. I'm not doing that. Because you can't believe God when he speaks to you. You've not learned that it's money first. The Bible says money involves a supernatural dimension of dominion. Dominion is the right to rule or literally the right to determine what happens. And you are either ruled over, someone else is determining what happens in your life, or you are ruling and determining what happens. Disobedience in money causes a loss of dominion. Achan, the Bible said he disobeyed in the area of money, and in battle he had no, they had no ability to defeat the enemy. They lost. The enemy ruled over them. Those who cannot obey God in money, those who cannot believe God in money, those who don't break through in money, struggle in many other areas of their life because there is a connection between money and dominion. To be able to overcome the powers of hell is going to be connected to what you do with your resources. 1 Samuel 7.10, while Samuel was burning the offering, the Philistines came near to attack Israel, but the Lord thundered against them with a loud thunder. They were so frightened they became confused. So the Israelites defeated the Philistines in battle. In that text is exactly what I told you, money first. We need to defeat the powers of hell. Some of you here, you desperately need the powers of hell to be defeated in your body, in your family, in your marriage, in your church, the Bible says they made an offering. And when they made an offering, money first, then they were able to defeat the enemy. If you can gain money dominion, I want to tell you it is transferable. I love the story of David when he comes to see the giant defying the, the people of God. And he says, I'll fight him. And they bring him in like, what, what are you thinking? And he said, well, I fought a lion. God help me. I fought a bear. So he understood then apparently I will be able to fight and defeat a giant. In other words, I gained dominion in this area. I can transfer it. If you can get dominion in money, you can get dominion in your marriage, in your fruitfulness, in many areas of life. If you can believe and break through in the area of money, you can believe and break through in any area of life. Let's look at one more thought. I want to talk about the need for dominion in money. How do we get dominion in money. The first thing that has to happen is you need to hear from God about money. Two times, Elijah heard from God about provision. Verse 2, then the word of the Lord came to him saying, go to Cherith. Verse 8 and 9, then the word of the Lord came to him saying, arise and go to Zarephath. I want you to catch this. Hearing from God enabled Elijah to gain miracle 
provision for personal needs and for the ministry. You have to have personal revelation for God's miracle provision. I told you this morning, when I wanted to see miracles of healing, I went to God's Word. That's where you get it from. I found every verse on healing and power and answers to prayer until it became mine. The key in your life is not what is the economy. Don't care. It is not who's in charge politically. Doesn't matter. What's the unemployment rate? What's the economic? That is not. What is your educational status? That's not the issue. The issue is what does God say about money and secondhand revelation will not work. Remember the seven sons of Siva? They came, they prayed in the name of Jesus of Nazareth that Paul preaches. And that didn't cut it. The, de the demon-possessed man jumped on them, beat them, and stripped them because second-hand revelation doesn't work. In the same way, you cannot say, Pastor Joe Campbell says, Pastor Mark Olson says, that's great. They, they tell inspiring stories in conference, but that is not going to help you at the end of the day. You have got to hear from God for yourself. That is, first of all, hearing from God in His Word, so it's personal revelation, and then it is hearing the voice of God in what He wants you to do. Second thing is you need personal obedience in money. Miracle provision hinges on steps of obedience. In our text, command number one, go into the middle of the desert. Command number two, go to a foreign country where you don't know anyone. Sometimes God will speak to you and it will not make sense. God, why would you send me into the middle of desert? There, there are no grocery stores there. Doesn't make sense. Why would you send me to a foreign country? They don't like foreigners there. This doesn't make sense. Have you ever had the voice of God speak to you and it doesn't make sense? You're already struggling. You're like, God, I need, I need more. And God says, okay, give some away. You're like, uh, Lord, you know, I, did, I paid attention a little bit in school. Mathematically, that doesn't work. I need more, and you're telling me to give away. Now I have less. But you gotta, you got to be willing to obey. God challenges every person and every man of God with steps of obedience. That, of course, begins with the tithe. That is a regular way of showing that you believe God, the first 10%. Let me just say something that hurts my head is pastors that are sent out, that are crying out, oh God, we need miracles. You've got to give us fruitfulness. We need money. But you don't send your reports and you don't tithe. That hurts my head. How do you expect to ever get ahead? <laughs> That's, that just doesn't make sense. How do you think you're going to get your people to tithe and believe God? There are then, of course, moving beyond the tithe. That's, that's baby steps. Beyond that, there are points in time when God will challenge us in obedience to God about finances. Third thing for pastors here, you need to be able to challenge other people about money. 1 Kings 7, 13, Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you've said, but make me a small cake from it first, bring it to me, and afterward make some for yourself and your son. Unless 
Pastor, you have a personal conviction and personal faith for money. You're going to be unable to challenge other people effectively. And let me say your faith and your willingness to challenge people cannot be based on people's circumstances. As I said, I went to spent seven and a half years in South Africa. We had numbers, many missionaries that came through, some of which struggled and were not successful. Let me tell you a common denominator in those who struggled as missionaries. They came in the face of abject poverty, and they felt sorry for the people, and they said, I can't challenge these poor people to give. They're already struggling. I preached on tithing one time, gave a challenge for people to tithe. That a young man that had been coming. He came up. He was very sincere. And he said, Pastor, I support my elderly grandma. He said, you're telling me to tithe, to give away 10%. The problem is, he said, if I tithe and give away 10%, grandma's going to starve. What should I do? Now, there are people at that point, they go, it's okay, brother. God understands, but I believe God. And I said, you need to Believe and obey Almighty God and trust Him to take care of Grandma. Because I believe it. And every time I saw people in abject poverty, when they obeyed God, God did miracles for them. And so you have to be able to challenge. Listen, it bothers me when a pastor gets behind the pulpit and apologizes for taking an offering. I don't apologize. I, I feel I am doing people the greatest favor of their life because I'm putting them in contact with a supernatural dimension that can change everything. So you have to be able to challenge others about money. But here is the final thought I want to leave with you. The story of Elijah is this. You can experience miracle provision and finances. What a story. Go into the wilderness. There are, there are no stores. There's no crops. There's no way to naturally be fed. And ravens come and brought him food morning and evening. Ravens, they're like crows, right? They're takers. I have never had a knock at the door and a raven said, I've got a gift for you. Never. But God caused something to happen that is against common sense and the course of nature. He goes into a foreign country. Naturally, people, you know, they are xenophobic. They're afraid of. They're suspicious of outsiders. A foreigner walks up to a woman who is about to starve to death and says, can I have some of your food? Bring it first. And God does a miracle of provision. 1 Kings 17, 15, and 16. So the woman went home and did what Elijah told her to do. And the woman and her son and Elijah had enough food every day. The jar of flour, the jug of oil were never empty, just as the Lord, through Elijah, had promised. Listen to me. We need miracles, financial miracles. You need it personally. The people in your church need it. Your disciples need it. If we are going to do the work of God, if we're going to reach the nations of the world, 
We need miracle money. We need miracle buildings, miracle vehicles, miracle finances. And God is well able to do that. Let me tell you two testimonies. Pastor Carlos Morales in Norfolk, Virginia, they needed a new building. And he began to believe God, not just to give him a building to buy or rent, He started asking God, God, I am asking you to give me a building. Said he contacted a commercial realty company about a building. The owner of the company asked to meet with him, came to his church, and he said, I explained to the owner of the company about our church, our fellowship, and our vision And God put it on this man's heart to donate a vacant bowling alley to them. Not only did he give him the building, he gave them a little over $100,000 to pay the attorney fees and start construction. I want them to show some pictures of Carlos Morales' miracle building. You can show the next picture. 40,000 square foot building, next picture, the front entrance, and here, 18 months later, next picture, final picture there, Easter Sunday, they moved in to their miracle building. God could do that for you. Do you think God got tired after giving this? (sighs) I'm worn out. I got no more. A miracle working God provided. Why? Because his servant is doing his will and dared to believe our God who is unlimited. God, I'm asking for a miracle. What could God do for your church? Is it a building? Is it a vehicle? Or the resources to be able to plant? This is also true Personally, we have a couple we just planted into Sarasota, Florida. John and Dana Duff. Dana gave me this testimony. She said we were living in a 600-square-foot, broken-down duplex in a bad neighborhood. It was not a good place to raise a family. She said, I began to pray with a specific list of what I was asking for. I wanted a clean three-bedroom house with carpet and a fenced backyard. We couldn't find a decent, affordable place In December, my husband asked me whether I wanted shoes or perfume for Christmas. I was pregnant, and I was sick of living in that house. So I prayed and said, God, all I want for Christmas is a new house. An hour later, I got a call that a house opened up to rent, a three-bedroom house with carpet. It was clean with a fenced backyard. They lived there for a while. Then we heard that our landlord was selling his houses. So I called him and asked him, would you sell us the house we're living in? He said, get it appraised and I'll sell it to you for the appraised value. She said, I had already checked and I knew the house was worth uh, somewhere in the region of $325,000. I said, I already know what it's worth, but I need it cheaper. (laughs) Said, this is what it's worth, about $325,000, but we can't pay that. I want to pay two hundred to 225000 And the man said, I'll tell you something that will put a smile on your face. How about you buy it for $225,000, $100,000 under market value. Thank God. She said, I told my husband, God gives gifts that keep on giving. Listen, we serve an unlimited God, an unlimited God. You can believe him in tomorrow night's offering and Thursday night's offering and Friday night's offering because he is unlimited. If he speaks, he is able to supply. You can begin to pray for God's favor in your life, in your ministry, whatever it is, because as my father often said, The revival in Prescott wasn't just because it was the 70s. It wasn't just because 
they happened to meet some people. He connected it to when he gained money, dominion. So my question as we close, how many people here you are going to change your life, your ministry, your legacy by gaining money, dominion? Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes all across this place. Thank God. With our heads bowed, first of all, there may be people that are here that you are not right with God. The first miracle you need is not money. You need salvation. You must deal with your sin problem. God loves you. He knows exactly what you're doing, and he knows that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin ruins and cuts us off from anything good from God. And yet, here's God's plan. He made a way. Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sin so we could go free. If you're here tonight and you're not right with God, then my challenge to you is turn from your sin, ask God to forgive you, and ask Him for the power to live a new life. How many people here, you say, I'm not right with God. I want to get right with God. I want to turn from my sin. I want to pray for God's forgiveness. If that's what you want to do, lift up your hand so I can see it. How many would there be all across this place? Pastor Greg, I need Jesus. Lift up your hand right now. God's dealing with people. You want to get right with God. Hold it up high before we do anything else. You say, I want God to save me. Some of you are backslidden. You were saved. You turned your back on God. There's a hand there. God bless you. How many others? Lift up your hand. Hold it up high. Unsaved or backslidden. Thank you. I see that hand at the front. God bless you. Thank you. People are responding quickly. We're going to pray for something else in a moment. You want to get right with God, lift up your hand right now. God loves you. He'll help you. Thank God. I want those people, if you lifted your hand, stand up. I want to have someone pray with you. Stand up. Don't wait. Don't, don't wait. Do it right now. Stand up to your feet. Come here. Come here to the front. Get out of your seat. Come here to the front. God's going to help you. I want somebody to come pray. Someone praying with every one of these, a man with this man. These young men, I need a couple of guys to pray for them. Thank God. Kneel down anywhere at the front. Someone's going to pray for you. Quickly, I need workers to pray for them. Lead them in a sinner's prayer. In a moment, we're going to open the altars, and I'm challenging about money dominion. I am challenging. There are people here you recognize currently you don't have dominion. You're ruled by debt. You always struggle financially. You need to break that curse. You don't have to live that way. We serve an unlimited God. There are people you've been living with just barely enough in your life. You've been, there are things you genuinely need and you don't have because you don't have money dominion. Let God put faith in your heart. There are pastors here. You need to establish convictions. You need to establish faith to challenge and believe God for miracle provision because we serve an unlimited God. He's able to help us. Let's all stand up to our feet. I'm opening the altars. I want you to come. Find a place to pray. You talk to God. Some of you need to repent. You've been disobedient in the tithe or disobedient to the voice of God. You've doubted His provision. Repent. Tell God, I want to change. I need something to change in my heart so that we can have money dominion. Go ahead and sing while people are coming. As the
want you to bow your heads now for a moment. I want to agree with you for breakthroughs. You've done business, some of you, with God about issues of your heart. And now I want to agree with you that God is going to bring miracle provision. He's going to change the circumstances. For some of you, that is to get out of debt. Some of you are struggling. You, you desperately need housing or a vehicle or you need a job that is sufficient in inflationary times. Pastors here, you need a breakthrough in your church finances. Some of you need buildings. I don't care what it is. We're going to pray for miracle breakthroughs in finances. Lift up your hands right now. And I want you to say this out loud. Say, Father God, I am your child, and you are an abundant God. Your will for my life is abundance. God, forgive me for doubting your ability to provide. I repent. Forgive me of bad stewardship, wrong financial decisions. I repent. I want to be a good steward. God put faith in my heart. Change me. Open my eyes in your word. Give me a revelation about your ability to provide miracle resources. You see the need in my life that I'm asking you for. In my church, we need miracle breakthroughs. Supply what we need so that we can do your will. And I am asking you, open the windows of heaven. I will believe you. I will contend. And I will obey in expectation of miracle breakthroughs. In the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you in advance for miracle provision in Jesus' name. Now let's praise God for that right now. Hallelujah, Lord God, hallelujah. Shut up, I carry, baby, 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 baby. Shut up, I carry, baby, baby, baby. Oh, God, I need you now, Lord God. I need you now, Lord God. Shut up, I carry, baby, 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 baby. Oh, God, I thank you, Lord God. I praise you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, I know that you can help us. Behold, do I not care for my workers, yea, even my sons and daughters? Behold, you are in the harvest field, and you have allowed a place for weariness in your soul. I have even made a place for you. Even come unto me, I will give you rest deep inside of your being, yea, even my altar. Even this week I have made a place for you to receive of refreshing and of strength. Yea, I am with you when you go through the valley. Yea, I am with you when you go through the floods. Uh, you will not drown nor be burned in times of fire. Behold, there will be testing. Behold, I have called you to a great work. Uh, but I will hold you. I will care for you. Even with my righteous right hand, I am able to provide. Uh, even come unto me and find that place. Uh, even the secret place. Even this altar. Uh, even this week, saith God. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, I thank you. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.